Welcome everyone to How to Future Proof Your Career Deep Tech Edition by SG Innovate and in support of New Frontier 2021 and SG Women in Tech. I'm Zing from SG Innovate and if you're new to us, we are a government-owned organization in Singapore with the mission to build deep tech innovations from Singapore for the world. We invest in and help build deep tech startups in the fields of AI, medtech and quantum tech just to name a few. We work with entrepreneurial scientists and clinicians to help bring their innovative research from lab to market, and we also develop tech talent and engage with a vibrant deep tech ecosystem. Today, we are very excited to hear from our diverse panels of experts, Nicole, Sinue, Zuhan, and Aziza, as they share about the varied opportunities in the tech industry and what it would take to prepare yourself and remain employable for tomorrow's career. We hope today's discussion will inspire you to look into tech careers, and if you're interested to learn more, on 10 April 2021, SG Innovate will be hosting our new Frontier 2021, exclusive showcase of deep tech apprenticeship, full-time roles and workshops, and exciting fields such as AI, cybersecurity, and software development. Just some house rules. During the webinar, if you have any questions during the event, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And do feel free to use the chat box to connect with our wider community. Uh, now, let me hand over the time to our moderator for today, Aziza Shirin, Managing Director of Asia, of General Assembly, to start the panel. Aziza, please. Thank you so much, Zing, and thank you, SG Innovate, for organizing this. Hi, everyone, joining from home. Um, you know, we've got a great lineup today. It is, a, uh, it is a diverse panel because they've got, like, such different experiences, and I think all of those are important as we talk about, you know, how to really prepare um, and perhaps, um, you know, prepare your skills. Um, how do you think about, as you're thinking about your careers, especially in the deep tech field? Um, so we've got Zihan, Sinewe, and Nicole. And what I'm going to do is rather than read out their bios, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your story. Nicole, how about we start with you? Thank you so much. And, you know, really wonderful to be here with this amazing group. So thank you for having me. I'm Nick Scoble williams uh, I at lead our Future of Work efforts for the Asia-Pacific region for Deloitte. I had the privilege of being with the program since we first established it four years ago. So first of all, in Singapore for three years, leading our Global Future of Work Center of Excellence. And then a year and a half ago, relocated to Japan, where I am now, uh, to continue leading our efforts. And so, of course, after the last year of disruption, uh, you know, this has been a really important moment in time for those of us in the Future of Work area. And... Uh, Hopefully together we can all share some really helpful insights for our audience today. Thanks, Nicole. And I'm sure like last year must have definitely accelerated some of your work. Um, um, Zihan, tell us a little bit more about your story and what you do at SG Tech and also what SG Tech is. Yeah, that's a very important one. What SG Tech is, right? Most people don't know. <laughs> I see Sinue laughing. Uh, so SG Tech is a non-profit association. We represent the industry. We represent about a thousand tech members, including people like uh, Sinue and Tiger, right? Uh, and our role is really to be a bridge uh, between the government and the industry, a bit of that nebulous in-between space, right? That nobody really knows what's about, what it's about. Essentially, we, we want to feed, uh, give feedback to the government, uh, be a voice for the industry. But we also want to help the government push down initiatives that we think you know, will really help the industry. And so our role is really to, you know, co-create, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, co-execute even, right, many of these programs. Uh, specifically for me, um, I look at uh, talent development, uh, capability and capacity building, uh, primarily talent for the past few years, but also increasingly more into uh, a digital transformation and trying to solve that problem of how we can bring along uh, our local SMEs, right, uh, to help them to keep up as well. Uh, this, this is a, uh, an issue that we've been trying to deal with as a nation, uh, mm -hmm. for a number of years now. Uh, and actually, Tech is trying to do our part in that space as well. Sounds great. So you guys are like the connectors between the industry yeah. and the government. Um, so anyway, on to you, by the way, I love your backdrop. That's you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's so <Thank> adorable. <laughs> uh, my name is Sinue Arroyo. I'm the founder and, and CEO of Tiger. I'm also the honorary treasurer of the SE Tech chapter for AI and, uh, and high-performance uh, computing. So I'm very honored for that. Uh, Tiger is um, uh, a local company. Um, we operate in the automation space. We are an AI company. Uh, we work with large financial institutions, a lot with the government of Singapore, 
we have a presence here in, in Singapore, where this is home, we are headquartered here, and then also in Spain and uh, Middle East and, uh, and, and Mexico, so quite, quite aligned there. Uh, my background is in computer science. I'm a, I'm a technical person by background. I, I taught myself how to code when I was 10 years old. I then went on to study uh, computer science. I, I lived through the dot-com boom as a programmer. I, I worked through the ranks, project manager, et cetera, et cetera. Did an MBA uh, from Chicago Booth, uh, executive MBA. I hold a PhD in AI. And uh, I've been in Singapore for the last six, seven years. Wow, that's like really impressive that you taught yourself how to code at 10. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, <laughs> thank you. All right. So, um, you know, just before we dive in, um, you know, I just want to say this to the audience members, you know, feel free to type in the chat, you know, where you're from, um, what you're doing. And also, please feel free to ask questions um, as we're going along. You don't have to wait for the last 15 minutes to put your questions. The reason is because, you know, if your questions are tied to an area that I'm discussing, I can always just weave that in with the panelists. And it also helps me understand how much time we should have for Q and A's based on what you're asking. Um, all right, so, uh, so anyway, I'm gonna start with you for this, okay? So deep tech seems to be a sort of a catch all phrase. What exactly are we talking about when we say deep tech? When you talk about deep tech, you're talking about uh, really uh, something that uh, is transformative, that creates a, a larger barrier of entry, something that, you know, you've, you've gone, you're pushing the technology, the boundaries of, of technology. You're creating something that, I, I like to say it in three buckets, right? You have the, the R&D bucket, the, the research bucket, you have the engineering bucket, and you have the marketing and commercialization bucket. And you can build products and companies starting in any of these positions. You can say, look, um, I'm, I'm not good at technology. I don't understand technology, but I found a gap in the market. I'm very good at marketing and sales. I'm going to go and start in the marketing and sales budget. I'm going to be in a, in a niche position. Maybe I do a chatbot for the, for the health industry that is very specific for Singapore. Uh, okay, it's not technologically differentiated, but it solves um, a market gap. And you can do that where technologies become kind of commodities. Then you can say, you go one step backwards, right? And you can say, look, um, I'm a really good engineer. I, I'm, I'm not a researcher. I don't really understand how to push the boundaries of technology. One good example would be quantum technology, right? I mean, this is very much groundbreaking. You are doing physics, you're doing all that stuff. Well, that is deep tech, right? So you can say, look, I, I don't know about that, but I'm really good at building software products, for example. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to build this amazing software product is I'm using the technologies that are around me. So I use Java, I use HTML. Uh, an example of that probably would be an HR system, right? You are not discovering any new technology, but you are putting together all the pieces out there to build a more a uh, functional product, a more resilient product, a more beautiful product. And then you take it to the next bucket and you have to sell it and commercialize it. And then you can go back and say, look, um, I'm a researcher and this is how Tiger really started. Um, I'm passionate about the technology. I'm passionate about pushing the boundaries and finding and, and, and exploring and, and, and creating new technologies and, and, and really exploring that, that path, right? So I'm going to create a breakthrough in, in, in technology that then um, with that breakthrough, I'm going to go into the engineering bucket, I'm going to build a product, and then I'm going to go to the sales and commercialization bucket, and I'm going to you know, go to the market, et cetera. So depending where you start in the process, you, your barrier of entry, your differentiation is going to be smaller if you start in the sales and marketing, larger if you start in the engineer, and super large if you start on the, on the deep tech uh, research uh, bucket. Long explanation, I hope useful. <laughs> no, I think that was great for context setting um, because, you know, when we think deep tech, we're thinking like, oh, is this all just like very futuristic? But I really like how you broke it down into different teams and also very realistically how it gets adopted commercially into companies. Um, Zihan, so you work a lot with, um, you know, in your association with companies. Um, you also work with a lot of SMEs. You know, are they thinking about these things? You know, have you seen any applications related to this? What are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I dare not talk about the deep tech side of things, but I definitely know some practical applications, right, uh, from our members. And what I was thinking of, you know, um, more recently is, you know, the whole idea of trust tech, right, and how 
that is actually a barrier from people crossing over into the digital space a lot of the times, you know. Uh, uh, very specifically is, you know, the whole issue around digital signatures and e-signatures, right? And so one of our companies is actually looking to solve that problem. Um, you know, digital e-signature is not new, but even putting in place, you know, a way to send uh, documents peer-to-peer that is on the blockchain and still verifiable, right? And so, you know, that's an ex- a- a excellent uh, uh, example of that. The company's name is Dedoco, D-E-D-O-C-O, mm. right? So it's a member of Ashitech as well. Um, the other one, uh, also linked with, you know, skills and all, right, uh, is the whole idea of having digital certificates uh, on the blockchain as well. So your whole life, uh, if you are just a bucket of skills, right, um, all these certificates that can verify those skills, right, are put on a blockchain and you can essentially, you know, um, carry that with you forever. And you no longer need to uh, try to save your yellowing uh, uh, university degrees, right, uh, and all these will be uh, online and on the blockchain and immutable, right? Verifiable. Uh, and the company is called Accredify, right? So companies like this make, uh, you know, deep, deep tech technologies, right? Uh, very, very practical and, and usable and something that can easily turn into, you know, something that is mass adopted and help people make that switch essentially, right? Literally from a paper uh, document, right? Uh, to a completely digital one. Yeah, and I think that's especially helpful when you're moving countries or like, you know, we have uh, some people on our team who may have gotten degrees in other languages and they have to translate it, notarize it, and then like go back if the translation wasn't like the exact word. I feel like this is going to solve a lot of it, especially as we have more um, global movement of talent um, with our current workforce. And that brings me to Nicole. So Nicole, you work with um, a lot of uh, large companies. Um, tell us how they're thinking about um, this area. Yeah, so I think it, it's amazing to see just what is happening in all of this world of technology. I mean, I think we've all seen this past year of disruption just unlock incredible acceleration from a technology perspective and even more important, highlighting our ability to embrace and use it and unlock value I think what I would probably, you know, offer the audience is the shift that we are seeing more broadly in how executives are thinking about the role of technology in their organisations. So to give you an example, some of our audience might be familiar with our global human capital trends research that we do every year. Before the pandemic, we had... 29% of executives around the globe telling us that they were really mainly focusing on using technology and they were really focusing on optimising the work of today. How do we do it quicker, cheaper, you know, everything about efficiency. Fast forward last December, you know, when we've now gone through the the experience of the pandemic, we then had 61% of executives tell us we have pivoted. We are now focusing on reimagining work altogether moving forward and recognising that in order to do that, we need to focus on the combination of humans interacting with technology as collaborative teams to unlock new possibilities, new outcomes that have never before been possible. And I think this is quite a a pivotal shift, you know, from actually looking at what technology do I need to invest in and and taking a technology-led approach to actually saying, what if we can actually unlock all of this possibility by just focusing on the potential and the capability of the people we've got, the technology that's out there. And I think what we've seen over the last year has shown us, you know, what we really can achieve. So I think that's been quite a shift in how we just think about all of the technology. Thanks, Nicole. Um, That was very helpful. I just saw Jenny's question. Um, Jenny, thank you for asking that question. I'm going to go to it in a minute. But before that, I just want to frame the conversation as well, you know. Um, So we see a lot of uh, articles about how all these advancements in technologies, they're going to lead to Um, you know, job creation, but also job displacement. Um, You know, what types of like, you know, where are you excited about these things? Or are you, um, you know, worried about some areas on where people might lose their jobs, or where they you think that there may be more opportunities for people? Any of you can start. I maybe I go first. I I think it's, it's an exciting thing. I'm excited about it. 
I think it's going to uh, to be a very positive um, development for for all of us, for the industry, for Singapore, for for the world reality. As every time that change happens, we as persons we are like, how is this going to affect me? Is this going to be good for me? Is it going to be? There is some resistance to change, and we've all heard this. Um, same as before, right? We are talking about jobs right now that didn't exist even 10 years ago, not even five years ago. Data scientists, where did that mm -hmm. come from, right? And that is creating a massive uh, amount of wealth and, uh, and, and people get educated and, uh, and jobs and, and stuff. Some others are going away. I, I believe in Australia, for example, they stop up this um, uh, degree for radiologists to understand uh, the x-rays and, and all that stuff. And they discontinue that. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's the market is adapting. You can you have to flow with it. I think the key is discontinuous learning, right? Let's let's keep on moving and let's keep on being flexible, open-minded. You cannot think now a job is going to last for the rest of your life like it was before, or that you're going to be doing the same thing uh, when you started your career, when you ended up. I started as a programmer, now I'm the CEO of, of, of this business. Maybe when I'm done being CEO of this business, maybe I become something else, right? You have to be on the move. And I think it's a positive thing. Thank you, Sinway. You know, that's really on point because I remember reading this article that, you know, people are going to change their jobs every like seven to 10 years and the kind of skills that you need are just going to shift. Nicole, from an organizational perspective, how are you seeing um, companies think about their strategy to deal with this? Yeah, and I really echo those comments about what an exciting time it is, you know, that I think this last year of disruption has unlocked. That same research that I just mentioned, you know, our December human capital trends research, we found that when we asked executives what matters to you the most, what are your priorities in you being able to respond to, to be prepared for this new world of perpetual disruption. We were very surprised with the answer we got. The number one priority around the world. Now, you know, they could have said anything around mm -hmm. technology, you know, anything. The number one priority was the ability of our people to reskill, to adapt, and assume new roles. Now, how telling is that? You know, I mean, all we have to do is have a look at the way that we have seen organizations rapidly redeploy people, rapidly reinvent products and services to really rally and contribute to what we need to do to navigate all of the disruption together, whether it be, you know, hospitals or vaccine development or, you know, masks, whatever. But I think there is no question that it's not just a case of, you know, yes, we're going to need people to continue to be able to develop. I think it's actually an imperative. I think, you know, there is this acceptance and expectation that we are now in a world where we will continue to navigate multiple, highly unlikely, unexpected events, and that to be successful, the thing that's really going to matter is that we've got people who are resilient and adaptable. The deep technical skills, they're going to come and go, but the resilience, the adaptability to very quickly huddle, and I think that's exciting because that's also making organisations focus on capabilities and potential saying we need to be really careful right now. Mm -hmm. We should be looking beyond what where somebody sits on an org chart or beyond what somebody's job description says. We need to make sure we've got visibility and access to the amazing capabilities and potential that are available to us. So as when we need to pivot, we can do that very, very quickly. You know, and all you've got to look is at some of the organizations that have had internal talent marketplaces, you know, in place before the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, and how the power of AI enabled them to rapidly redeploy workers on the most important work, unlock our, you know, 
hours that otherwise would be there unutilized. And so, yeah, I think it's exciting and an imperative. Thank you, Nicole. Um, this is uh, really on point because I was just talking to a researcher yesterday and they were talking about how, you know, when we think of jobs, we think it's like this one full job. We don't really think skills and transferable skills. And they were talking about something similar to what you said, where when the pandemic hit, organizations started looking at, okay, this division's not doing so great because of the pandemic, but these people have the skills that are transferable. How do we get there? So that's like super helpful. Um, Zihan, you know, from the perspective of like the startups and the SMEs that you work with, you know, I'm sure like when the pandemic hit, they were more impacted. Um, you know, how are you seeing them um, react to like, say what Nicole just talked about? Uh, yeah, I think before I jump into that, I just wanted to build on what the previous two panelists have shared and I echo their sentiments, right? I think it's a very exciting time. We need to help uh, the best in class and the people who are creating value, people like Tiger, right? You know, uh, help them to grab the talent they need to push ahead as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm, I'm fully for the catch the win, you know, uh, kind of philosophy, right? But at the same time, I also want to bring the conversation back to the human element of it, right? Um, as individuals, you know, having to deal with, you know, the macro, the, uh, the macroeconomics and the whole situation on a large scale, right? Um, and the fourth industrial revolution. These are huge topics. And, and when, when we hear about uh, these things, right, uh, at the top leadership level, often it's really unnerving for people on the ground. And I think one of the scary things about um, what's happening is things are changing so fast, but uh, not as many employers are investing in the training that is required uh, in order to help the workforce keep up, right? So, it, you know, it's a higher fire, you know, uh, mentality sometimes, right? Um, so thankfully, you know, within Ashley Tech, uh, we, are, we are seeing that, you know, that's something that we're trying to uh, uh, mitigate. And a lot of companies are on board with the programs that we are supporting mm -hmm. in this space, right, to help people to understand that, hey, you know, just because, you know, things are changing all around you, it doesn't mean that, you know, every two years you have the rock com completely pulled out from under your feet. Maybe it's just a cost, cost correction, not so much a complete overhaul of what you're trying to do. And so that's where the continuous learning will have to come in, but also understanding where your strengths are and how you can progress from there, right, instead of uh, feeling... Uh, uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, lost, you know, uh, with all the, the deep tech trends that are coming up. Um, on the SMEs and the uh, startups, right, uh, actually more on the SMEs, I'm actually not so worried about the startups because they know what, what they're doing and they're they are mm -hmm. fully on board with the you know, technology and being native to that, right? Um, SMEs in more traditional spaces, a, a bit more worrying with the COVID situation. Um, some surveys actually found that um, uh, the divide is growing, right? A lot of traditional SMEs have actually put their digitization on hold as opposed to the middle and larger companies that have actually accelerated these processes, right? So that is actually creating a growing divide. Um, and it's very worrying at a country level because 70% um, of our workforce employed by SMEs, many yeah. of them in the more traditional spaces, right? Um, so this is something that, you know, it's a recent phenomenon. We really have to dig into, dig into it a bit more deeply, right? Um, so Ashitech is trying to integrate the concept of digital transformation together with skills. Normally, it's taken as a completely separate thing, right? The people who are driving the agenda on tech are different from the people who are driving the agenda on upskilling and reskilling. We are saying it needs to be uh, one in the same, right? And seen as an as a integrated process. Got that. Thank you, um, Zihan. And I'm going to, um, you know, next segue into like one of the things that you talked about, which is like competencies building. Nicole also shared about that. And we've got a few questions on skills. So I think now would be a good time for us to start. Before we go into the kind of technical skills that are needed, which I will come to you, um, Zinoe, is, um, you know, are there any, so Jenny asked, you know, is there only tech roles in tech industries? You know, what are some of the non-tech roles that you're seeing? Or rather, what are some of the transferable skill sets um, that would be good from, say, a humanities or an arts or a psychology background that you're seeing? Uh, the answer is definitely not. There is, there is a need for other than tech roles in the, in the tech industry. Uh, you need marketing roles, uh, you need sales roles, you need project management roles, uh, you, you need HR roles, uh, everything, everything is, uh, is in here. What was the second part of the question, sorry? Um, the second part of the question, I'll, I'll touch on tech skills uh, in a bit, but in terms of transferable skills, um, are there any that you're seeing? Like maybe one of the examples that I could give is, um, you know, when we see employers coming to us mm -hmm. for okay. user experience design hires, there are two categories that they really like. Um, one is they like people with a research or a psychology background. Um, that is kind of valuable, right? Um, the second thing is people with a design, a traditional design background who could now like add user experience design on top of it. Like when you are hiring for say tech roles in your companies, 
are there any sort of like, I don't want to use the term soft skills, but are there any type of, type of like non-tech skills that you look for in a person? Yeah, so I, I'll put that into different buckets, the technical roles and, and the non-technical roles, right? And, and there is a bucket in between that is the mix where we really value people coming, for example, from SMU that have a double degree in business and, and technology. That is beautiful. And that fills a very important need. Uh, we don't just need people that understand deeply technology. Uh, we need people that understand the, 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 the in between for services, for project management, for, for many things. I think ultimately, and uh, as I'm, I'm very much with Nicole, what she said, uh, the hard skills are very important. You always have time to learn those if you if you put it, you put yourself to it. And, and not every person is going to be right for the hard skills. Mm -hmm. Not every person is going to be right for the soft skills. Not every person is going to be in between. Um, what we look ultimately, especially in the earlier candidates, is not so much whether they know how to program in Python or how to program in Java or they know machine learning, because we can build them through those programs and, and educate them. We, we, we want smart, intelligent, motivated people, people that is able to connect the dots. Um, people that, you know, they see this, they see that, okay, now that's what I'm going to do. Not just people that is good at doing what you tell them and because we don't micromanage. Uh, our, our environment is a bit brutal in that sense because uh, we empower people a lot. Uh, we tell them which direction we want to go just get us there. And mm -hmm. it's very polarizing. It's like you so, you throw them in the cold water. Some of them are going to be able to stay afloat and, and, and they're going to enjoy the trip. Some of others are going to, to sink because that environment is not for everyone. The ones that thrive, those are rock stars, right? So if you're if you able to make it in a company like Tiger, and there are many others, like adopt this, this culture, it's going to demand a lot from you, but it's also going to give you a lot back. So in that sense, uh, whether, especially again, early careers, uh, if you go higher up, you, you want a specialization. So yes, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm sourcing for this person that knows this very specific part of NLP because that's what we use and that's what we need for that project. But early, and, and I, I, I read there are some questions about people that has been off for 10 years and want to go back. Well, you have the skills, right? You just have to fine tune those skills into what is the market need at the moment that fits your interest. Uh, from um, uh, um, um, uh, different, different types of studies, not, not specifically mm -hmm. science studies, it's, it's, it's fantastic because at the end, it's all about communication. Uh, as the company grows, you need to communicate a lot. So you want people that not only knows about tech, but also people that is able to communicate with the different stakeholders within the company and externally. Uh, so you, yes, we will ask you to understand tech. We will educate you if you don't have that. But if, if you have the round packets, you are motivated, you're hungry, you want to do stuff, you're able to connect the dots, you, you will make it in deep tech, no, no question. Thank you for sharing that. And Nicole, you earlier talked about, um, you know, how companies are quickly redeploying talent. Um, and I feel like it kind of ties in with what um, Celia just talked about as well, you know, which is all about transferable skills, um, which is about skills that are, because tech, tech skills are like, you know, when people think about it, it's the easier one to build versus like that motivation or that um, ability to take on a challenge and run with it. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how you're seeing corporates think about this? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of elements perhaps in, in your question that I can touch on. Firstly, I, I think the, the initial part of your question is really about the way that we're seeing some organisations embrace internal opportunity marketplaces and not just to try to identify the right talent for the right work but to genuinely connect talent with opportunity in the broadest sense. Opportunity could be an assignment to work, but it could be a learning opportunity, a networking opportunity, a mentoring opportunity. You know, how do we actually use the energy, the motivation, the passions of our people to move us forward? What I, I think perhaps just, you know, building on some of the earlier comments, I feel that to move forward, we need what I call architects. 
you know, so when we talk about reimagining the future, mm -hmm. we talk about the act of doing that means re-architecting work itself. So actually unbundling the work and saying, what if, what if, forget about how we're doing it today and what we're doing, what are the possibilities that we could imagine if, you know, there was just an abundance of technology and talent. We need architects that can help us re-architect work where what we are doing is we are designing work around the way that humans work around the way humans engage, around what humans do best, and then saying, and how do we use technology to enable and elevate that so as we can unlock those outcomes that would never have been possible. So I think, you know, we often think about the technical people or the marketing people or the HR people, mm -hmm. but I think if we look at the work itself, and we say, how do we bring together, you know, these tribes, if you like, and bring them together for a shared mission, you know, and do that through the act of re-architecting work? Because I think it needs to be people that are looking at it through the lens of what we call super teams, you know, where we've got AI in the loop with the team, their teammates, their team members. So, you know, there, there's some of my, you know, thoughts to those elements. I love the concept of like super team. Sounds very Avengers y. <laughs> um, so if you think about it, you know, think about what has been achieved in vaccine development at unprecedented pace. That has been the best example of super teams. You know, if you actually go and talk to all of the organizations that have been driving that, they will tell you, we haven't just had people that were, you know, in the medical industry or the research industry or infection specialists. We just gathered from all around the world, anybody, anyone that had a passion, that had an interest, that could contribute. Technology gave us superpowers that, you know, I think... Uh, I'll forever reflect on, you know, the whole vaccine development as being possibly, you know, for, for as long as I live, possibly one of the greatest examples we'll see of the power of these super teams. Yeah, it was amazing how fast that was uh, rolled out. Um, so uh, Zihan, I'm going to move on to you. Um, you know, earlier you were talking um, during a prep call about how SG Tech figures out like what is like the kind of like the shortest distance between what a person's doing right now and how to get them into these fields. Um, could you like tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yes, uh, sure. The analogy was uh, crossing a career river, right? Uh, cross at the narrowest point possible. And that's something we advocate very strongly for. Um, I, I think there are agencies in place to help take care of uh, deep tech training. Um, and that's something that Singapore has done extraordinarily well in creating the training programs uh, mm -hmm and making them available to the most of the populace, right? Um, but where we really wanted to focus on was on a group that was more, more vulnerable, uh, essentially displaced, made redundant, right? Um, and on the fringes, right? Um, and we wanted to tighten that gap. And what we realized, that, you know, you know, supply demand, right? The employer demand uh, needs to be there as well as, you know, the job seeker supply needs to be uplifted, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so on the employer side, what we did was try to create programs that could reduce the risk uh, for employers in what we call tech light roles. So this is the in-between that uh, Sinway was, was referring to, right? Um, and, and some of the programs that we run, or most of them in fact, right? Uh, don't even require people to have any kind of IT background or experience, right? So uh, we train them in skill sets that, you know, they can essentially transition into. So answering a previous question, so that, you know, tech roles that don't require you to have IT backgrounds, right? Um, and examples of these, you know, are like digital sales, uh, being a Salesforce platform professional or SAP platform professional, um, things like that, right? Um, and, and we help uh, make that conversion and create the programs to reduce the risk for employers. On the job seeker side, um, actually what we've done is that we've created programs that can help uh, job seekers get the right kind of mindsets that Nicole has been talking about a lot, right? That resilience, adaptability, right? Uh, and that's something that we realized, you know, cannot be done within a half-day workshop or a two-hour workshop and say, hey, this is a mindset change workshop, right? Congratulations, you are now ready. Um, so what we did was create something that was uh, complete, pretty out of the norm. We created this seven-week uh, career support group program uh, that we wanted to leverage the power of facilitated coaching with peer-to-peer -peer group 
support, right? So creating a safe space that's facilitated and mentored by a, a trained professional, right? And getting them to, you know, help each other out. So we realized that this was a very powerful tool because, you know, hearing from a job coach, walking to a, a career center and hearing from a job coach who has no experience in what you're doing, I mean, telling you what to do when you're like 50 over years old, um, is, is a very uh, unsettling experience sometimes, right? As opposed, you know, to having somebody who's going through that journey with you, mm -hmm. walk with you, right? Um, that's a concept that, uh, you know, we, we started moving and, you know, we ran a pilot group, we did really well, you know, the first group of 19 of them, 17 of them managed to find jobs, uh, even though we tell them it's not a job search platform, right? Uh, so these are some of the examples, you know, even as a tech association, we're trying to find the niche where, you know, we think there are gaps and, and try to fill those gaps in order to make sure that, uh, that, that matching happens and we help people cross, right? Uh, and, and once they cross, they need to keep moving, like, like, like everybody has already shared. I mean, there's, there's, yeah. no, there's no way to stop. I love um, the concept of like crossing at the shortest point of the river, right? Because, you know, especially if you're in like in your 30s like us, you do have like a wealth of experience that like a little bit of experience that you can like bring to your next role. It's just about figuring out how do you take those transferable skills and add on new ones, um, which brings us to like Damien Tan's question. Thank you for your question, Damien. So Damien asks, is it too late to start in my mid 30s? Um, how do I go about learning these skills, especially when most employers still look at your experience or background? Um, a course or two will make me a programmer. How can I stay relevant? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? First, the age question. Do you, is that still a thing that employers think about? Totally relevant. Totally relevant. It's about the skills, about what you bring on the table. I don't care whether you are 30 or 55 or 60. If you can get the job done, uh, you are the best. I can, I can get a hold on. Um, I'm going to hire you, no, no question. And it uh, depends on, on what is the path, I mean, it depends what, what can he done. It depends what he wants to done, really, what to, to do. Uh, we have Skills Future, we have TESA, we have so many resources in Singapore. You can go and get a formal education. Uh, we have uh, NUS is being ranked in computer science, for example, number two worldwide uh, ahead of MIT. Mm -hmm. Uh, right here in Singapore, you don't have to go anywhere, right? So uh, you have all the options. You are, I, I started my PhD when I was 28, right? So it's, it's a matter of what you want to do and, and get it done. There is options out there. There is opportunities. You can get educated. You can get trained. Do it. Thank you, Zinoe. Um, Nicole and Zihan, is this, uh, what are you seeing from an employer trend perspective on this? Probably the first thing I should say is I'm, I'm definitely biased on this question because it may be a surprise to the audience to learn that my career began as a software engineer and I then 10 years later pivoted and went into genetics in the IBF industry and then pivoted again when I decided to focus on talent and human capital and consulting and then future of work. And along all of the journey, I've had a passion for law. And a month ago, I was admitted as a lawyer uh, in Australia. So I, I'm probably biased because I sincerely believe the only constraint is yourself. You know, I think what's important is that we enable all students, workers, everybody to have agency and choice and to really feel that provided you're prepared to step up to the challenge and embrace every opportunity as a learning, there are an abundance and unlimited pathways for, you know, for anybody. And I actually think that employers now are expecting their people to challenge themselves. They are expecting their people to be the ones to step up, to step out of their roles and show how they could and should contribute in new and different ways. I actually think that probably the surest way that we will all become irrelevant is if we don't do anything and we get comfortable. I think we need to embrace this world of perpetual disruption and say, amazing, I now have so much agency and choice in the paths I can take. How can I do that? So, yeah, I think it's an amazing moment. Nicole, I think this is like the second or third panel that I've been on with you. But <laughs> I swear, every time I'm like amazed at like your career transformation. And just, you know, the kind of like 
emotional resilience and courage that it takes to be like, I'm just going to go reinvent myself right now. That is amazing because, you know, we're going to be working like five decades. Why work in the same thing all of that time, right? Um, uh, Zihan, in terms of, uh, you know, what Damien asked, do you have any um, advice or any thoughts for Damien? Yeah, I just want to share some secondhand info that absolutely validates what both panelists have shared from other employers as well. Um, 30s isn't old, lah, right? But um, I, I do a lot with career switches, right? And there's a lot of... Uh, uh, it need negativity, uh, frustration, right? For good reason, right? And and sometimes that blame is put on a very tiny issue, ageism, right? And, and the accusation that employers are uh, ageist, right? In their uh, approach, and 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 you know, based on what the two panelists have shared, is uh, you know, I, I echo that that most, of, if not all, of the employers I speak to, it's really not about that. It's like the things that are associated, you know, it just happens to be correlated in some sense, right? Uh, but it's really not about age. It's uh, really that positive attitude of resilience that's already been all talked about. I mean, in, in our conversion programs, we have two candidates above 60, right? Um, so there you go. Sounds good. Um, thanks, Zehan. And, you know, I just want to like also touch on the topic of skills-based hiring and how you are seeing that happen. And also, um, so anyway, how you're doing that in your organization. Because one of the things, you know, it is true, like, for example, um, when we set up GA in Singapore six years ago, um, there was this um, requirement for a lot of like paper qualifications, grades, um, employers looked at pedigrees. But more and more, I'm noticing that they're more open to skills. You know, they've got their own they want to see what someone has built. Um, they've got their own processes to test for skills as well. Yeah. Are you seeing this as well? Maybe so maybe we can start with you. Like, you know, could you maybe just take us through like how you assess a candidate? So we, we definitely do uh, assess uh, candidates in different levels depending on the, on the roles. If we are talking about a technical role, uh, there will be a technical test. They will have to pass uh, the technical test. Uh, as a matter of fact, because it's time that they're investing with, sometimes we're even willing to pay them a bit of money for doing the test so that you know they get through the motions faster because uh, actually we're hiring a lot of people who have like 30 positions open at this time. Uh, and then it's, uh, again, depending on the where where on the career path they fit. If it's early stage, you, you are looking for different things. The interesting thing is like, we are getting a lot of applications also from overseas and they cannot compete oftentimes with the local applications because the education here is so great and, and you have such a good pedigree. And, and the kids here, they pass these tests with flying colors, whereas overseas, you know, is not so, uh, so brilliant. We hire people later on the career stage. We have people from Goldman Sachs, we have people from UBS, we have people from McKinsey, we have people from all the good pedigree companies. And that's great. <clears throat> But that doesn't, um, that doesn't mean they are going to get the job for sure. Uh, the competition is very high, uh, also from our side. So we put the bar uh, relatively high. We want the best and we only want the best. And, and, and that make, means that even if you come from McKinsey, if you come from Goldman Sachs, means nothing, you might not make it. They have a very good recruitment standard as well. So uh, they filter people very well as well. So going back to the process, it's going to be, uh, they're going to contact you, uh, the, the HR team, uh, they're going to have a preliminary conversation with you, see what, you know, what's your interest, where it fits uh, in principle, the, the company, what you want to do. Normally you have applied for a specific position with specific skill sets. We're going to test you for that. And then there's going to be a second uh, interview uh, with your direct manager to see where the chemistry is, is, is actually there, whether you know, the, 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 the culture fit, the motivation of fit, the, the fit with the, the person you're going to be working is, is there. And, and typically that's going to be it. Uh, we're going to do two interviews and, and one technical test for technical people. Now, for very senior people uh, that are going to be, for example, uh, working in the CEO office, or they are going to be a C-suit kind of uh, level or someone that is very important for the company, there is going to be a, another interview uh, with me and that's the final one and and that's I'm not going to be looking at any technical aspects or anything that's been taken care of all before so I don't really need to ask I'm just looking for again whether the person resonates with the the energy that the company has the culture where it's driven where it's 
you know, it's, it's an alignment. Do I think that this person is going to actually fit? And that's pretty much it for us. We try to do very fast, um, as fast as we can. Obviously, the higher up, the longer the process is going to be. And it's probably going to be a one or two more interviews there because we just want to be sure. The lower down, that's going to be faster. And we try to turn applications actually in one week from first contact to just you are in, no, sorry, we, we move on. That sounds amazing. Um, well, if you're watching at home, you should definitely be checking out Tiger's uh, careers page. Um, I also understand you've got uh, Tiger Academy, is that right? For yeah. like, do you want to tell us like how you're helping maybe like the people that you, who have just joined? Do you have like any process to like get them started? Yeah, so the, the Academy fulfills actually three roles, right? The first one, probably the least interesting here is it educates our partners, right? We do a lot of sales to partners. We want our partners to be properly onboarded to understand uh, how to sell the product or how to configure the product or how to maintain uh, the product, depending on the level. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have, uh, and this is less prominent now because we do it more on an ad hoc basis, uh, AI courses that we do, introduction to AI. And, and that's mostly me just going to some event here and talking about AI and, and this and that. That's less prominently featuring the academy. But the more important part for this conversation is going to be we get a new employee. And oftentimes they don't know about machine learning or they don't know about NLP or they don't know about semantic technology or you know, a combination thereof. So we have these paths where we are going to take them through and we're going to go, this is your career path, if you will, right? And this is what, if you want to go from junior engineer front end to um, mid engineer front end, this is the career path that you have to do. These are the courses that you have to do. This is the milestones that you have to do. It's not just time, it's, it's achievement. Come Tiger is an achievement meritocracy based uh, company. So we have super bright kids that in one year, they have their team uh, without zero, with zero experience. They come in, uh, they sew, they can, they can do the stuff and, and then they just get, we give them a group of people to work with them. So you can move through the ranks very fast, but there is always a very clear path. What do you need to do? What we expect you to do? And the Academy fulfills that role. It, it has all the, uh, for the Tiger thing, right? We also use, for example, Udemy and we hire external mm -hmm. courses as, as we see fit. But our goal is to build uh, people through the ranks. We want people to stay with us and progress and take more responsibility and grow as the company grow. We also uh, promote people uh, internally as much as we can. So sometimes you have to bring from outside, but as much as we can, uh, we promote. There is salary reviews every year. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, I mean, last month, we reviewed the salaries of 95% of the of the company, which is incredibly unusual in this day and age. In this climate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, we want to we want to recognize and acknowledge and value uh, the contribution that the team has done. Last year has been very hard for all of us, and they work extremely hard. And uh, if the company can do it, well, we're going to recognize that. Uh, we are even we have even a, a liquidity uh, ESO plan, so the employees when they come to companies like us. Uh, they will get a nice salary, but the upside is not the salary. The upside is the, your ESO, your options, right? So oftentimes employees perceive that as, you know, it's just paper, they're giving me paper. And we try to turn that around and say, look, every year we put money on the table and uh, for employees to encash those options and actually walk away with money from Tiger if, if, they, if they want to, right? So we're trying to do everything we can to define career paths, to, to empower them, to, to make them, you know, successful so that we are successful as well. Thank you, um, Sinue. It sounds like Tiger is an amazing place to work at. Um, you know, and a lot of that comes from having someone who sees the value of inclusive leadership, right? Which brings me to something Nicole was talking about earlier during our pep call. Nicole, you know, as we're all um, starting more uh, to do more hybrid and remote work, um, wh where do you see like the importance of inclusive leadership or even like practices like what um, Sinue talked about, which is pay equity, pay reviews, being fair? Yeah, you know, I think as I mentioned earlier, I feel like the imperative around inclusive leadership has not had the level of attention that it warrants. 
we have heard so much over the last year around the shift to hybrid working, around the need to try to sustain this flexibility, this need to continue to empower our workers. You know, I think that we have seen human potential at its best in many aspects and unlocked productivity that's really built the business case as well, you know, for some organisations. But if we take a step back and we think, well, that's all very nice, and especially for our brand if we're an employer, to be able to say, we offer flexibility, we will empower you, we have choice, and that's also going to enable us to, you know, have more diverse teams and create more amazing products and services. You step back and you then say, well, if you actually think about a day in the life of what's going on, this has the potential to be chaos. You know, who knows who is working, where, doing what, you know, who's going to be working this morning, this afternoon, who's got what going on. And so the role of inclusive leadership, I believe, becomes a critical part of dependency. First of all, we need inclusive leaders that are going to create a culture of trust and confidence where the way of working, the way of interacting within that team construct is completely built around these flexible and hybrid working models, where the experience of being a part of the team isn't affected whether I'm in the office in the meeting or connecting remotely while I'm driving somewhere and you know I think that inclusive leadership first of all to be able to say I recognize all of this amazing opportunity I've now got and in doing that I can now create amazing possibilities but I need to build that inclusive leadership to make it work and make it successful because otherwise uh, my hypothesis is mad chaos and we will actually, you know, it'll become destructive. Um, and then we will not sustain all of these new hybrid flexible ways of working. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and Zuhan, I saw that you already answered uh, Bernadette's question about when the next session's starting. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I'll just put that in the chat group as well so that like people can, could you just put that in the chat group as well so that people can, um, a yeah. join if they want to. Um, Bernadette has another question. Um, so Bernadette used to work as a solutions business architect and project manager in a global e-procurement solutions company. Um, she stopped work for 10 years to care for her children. And now she's looking at rejoining the workforce. What is the best way to kind of go about doing this? Any advice that any of you have? Like for someone who is a returning mom. Um, I, I would say um, that there is no issue. I mean, she still has all the skills and uh, maybe she's, she's off the market a bit because the specific, uh, you know, if she wants to go into tech, um, maybe I'm not a data scientist if that's what you want to be, right? But you can, you can get those skills. The basic package is there. Uh, you, you are a seasoned professional. You just need to get up today, brush up, and, and you are going to be able to contribute uh, tremendously and companies are going to value that right um, we uh, we we want to have a tiger for example we have to have senior people or people that has been through the through walks of life and that have seen other things and they can contribute to the to the company in different ways so it's not only you know i i, I know this very specific skill no it's, it's it's the whole package as i say it's connecting the dots is understanding, is, is, is helping the company moving forward. And you can do that in different ways. You can be a single contributor in a very specific way. Uh, I'm a programmer doing this very narrow thing, or you can be, you know, something more in between. So probably for her, and I don't know her background, um, the, the very niche technology aspect is not, you know, it's going to be probably more difficult, but something blended, something in between. Um, maybe she was in sales before. Well, why don't we complement that with some courses from Skill Future, from from Tessa around AI? That's where you want mm -hmm. to go, or blockchain, or quantum computing, and then you can start putting to work your your experience that you've honed through so many years in in applying it to the industry. So I, I see no problem. This is again, we have all the opportunities, we have the tools, and we are very privileged in Singapore to have all these 
learning opportunities. We just take advantage of them. And the industry is vibrant. There is a shortage of talent. So yeah. you're going to find a job, no problem at all. Thank you so much. Anyway, um, maybe if I could just add on to this question as well. We have a lot of like moms who've taken time off and want to return to work coming through to General Assembly as well. Um, and one of the things we say, see is that employers are shifting away from this notion of why is there a gap in your resume, especially as like sabbaticals become so norm in the tech industry, right? But we also recognize that there can be bias um, that, hey, you know, if you've like left for this many years, have you just lost your touch? Um, and that's a source of bias that I'm sure like Nicole can talk to on like how organizations are dealing with that. Um, but one story I have is um, this um, uh, lady who like left work for about five years and then she joined our data science program. She did find it hard to get her first job because employers were just kind of a little bit biased around that. So what we did was we connected her with one of our partners and they loved her background. And sometimes it's just about giving someone a leg up. There's another organization that I would direct you to. Um, it's called Moms at Work. Um, it's run by this amazing lady called Shelley Tori. What she's doing is basically she's partnering with a lot of large companies. You know, companies talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? She's kind of making them act on it. Um, so there's programs for uh, moms who are returning to work. Um, so Moms at Work is another organization I would encourage you to look at. Um, uh, Nicole, do you have anything to add on to that? Or we can yeah, move on to the next look, question. Yeah, look, I would say there's never been a better moment to be in this situation. Because over the last year, we have seen... Organizations have had to say, forget about what's on people's resumes. Forget about the job they're doing today. Forget about the skills they've got from yesterday. Let's focus on capability and potential. And a big part of that for somebody returning will be all of the amazing things that have added to the capability and potential through being a mom and having all of those elements. So I think. What I would encourage people in this situation to do is to say, keep in mind, organisations are making this shift. Organisations are already starting to say, we recognise we can't get stuck on skills, experiences, job titles. This is a world of continuous disruption. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. Let's look at the capability and potential that someone can offer us. And so I think as if this was me, you know, I would be wanting to, first of all, really tap into what are my passions, what are my interests, because that's going to motivate and inspire me and I'm going to be amazing. And then really try to highlight to those organisations that I might be talking to the contribution and potential that I can bring. Don't get burdened with what might be on your resume today. Focus on what you can contribute helping them move forward in this world of ongoing disruption. Can Thank I just you. add a very quick one? Because that's quite down our alley as well. Um, I, I think, you know, it's in, immediately intuitive to, you know, many people that, you know, employers are looking at more skills-based hiring, et cetera, et cetera, but not to individuals, right? Um, what we found is that a lot of individuals uh, struggle to understand um, pitching themselves as a, you know, a bag of skills, right? And, and a bag of strengths, right? Essentially what they can offer cross industry, cross role, cross sector, right? Um, and that's very difficult for people to, uh, it has been difficult for people to understand, right? Um, and so, you know, when you look, for example, if you just look at your resume, most people will immediately think, okay, this is the experience that I've had. And therefore based on this experience, you know, um, this is why you should hire me. And if the experience is no longer relevant, that's where they get stuck and they, you know, cannot cross that river, right? So I think, you know, first and foremost is really to be able to reimagine yourself like what Nicole and, and Sinue have done themselves, right? Um, you know, as what are your core strengths, right? Essentially, passions, core strengths, interests, right? Uh, and be able to articulate that uh, clearly. Uh, and these things will carry you across whatever role uh, you choose to transition into. And I think that's a, that's a good starting point that may not be immediately intuitive to, to people. Thank you, Zehan. Um, that was really helpful, Sinui Nicole. Um, and Zihan, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, people watching at home are kind of inspired to take that step at any age or any um, life cycle, because I think we're seeing employers be more open to things now than ever. And also it's a business problem. There's just not enough uh, supply 
<laughs> that's going to match demand, right? So they do have to get creative about, um, you know, their approaches as well. I'm going to end off with this question. Um, it's kind of combining Lydia Heng's question as well as Yan Bing's question. So, you know, Lydia was asking, you know, are data scientists and other tech roles like data engineer, machine learning engineer overhyped? Is there any investment value in specializing in these areas? Um, you know, and Yan Bing has also asked a similar question. Um, you know, do you have any insights into what roles will be hot in the future? Um, people do give the adage that the best time to start computer science was 10 years ago. Um, so maybe Sinui, you can take it first. And Zian and Nicole, you can talk about other roles as well. It doesn't have to be just like tech. Yeah. Okay, so first one, I completely disagree. There was, it's a bad time to start computer science. My nephews, um, um, drilling down on them that they have to start to study computer science. So uh, no, I, I, I disagree to that. Um, I think uh, data scientists are overhyped. Uh, I think uh, the industry is actually paying tremendous amount of money for no value or little value in some, some cases. Uh, I, I, as I said, I think this, this job was just created recently and I don't think it's going to go away, but as every uh, in the market, there is when there is high demand uh, and little supply, then supply starts to go up, so it has to go up, to go up, and then the market is stabilizes. So there is going to be a point that you know uh, it's not going to be so sexy, it's not going to be so well paid, it's not going to be the ultimate thing to do, and the market is going to uh, to stabilize. I don't think it's going to go away. I still think it's a, it's a good place to start. Also, it's important to note where AI is is moving. In some cases, you are you are hearing talking more and more about no code tools and, and all that stuff. So there is there is a point like everything where you get in there, you, you can be very well off, but then you have to realize this is not going to be forever. Um, I think that the usual but very robust stuff. You are a very solid programmer, let's say in Java or in Python or in any other language, front or back that always going, going to be in demand. I don't think that's going to go away in the next 20 years. And people, companies, we are extremely willing to pay top dollar for seasoned uh, top caliber engineers. Uh, Singapore is small. We have uh, a talent crunch, I would say. So uh, wherever you go, if you specialize, if you become top notch at whatever you do, you are going to have a very, very good ride. You're going to make money. You're going to be valued and, and you're going to be successful. Uh, I don't know what's coming. I don't know what's going to come in five years. Otherwise, probably, you know, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> I will be super wealthy, which I'm not. That, uh, if you had an answer to that with a crystal ball, that would be like a billion dollar. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. Uh, maybe around the corner, what I can tell you is just, even if you go back to the basics, just Java programming. It's always going to be demand for mm -hmm. senior architects, senior programmers, anything. It's always going to be there, I believe. Thank you, Sunway. And I think what you said kind of ties in what Nicole said earlier, right? Which is that we're going to see these like waves of like uh, tech and roles that are in demand. Like data still seems to be hot. A lot of like enterprises that you talk to, that seems to be their top of mind on trying to get those people. Um, and like what um, Nicole, you and Zehan alluded to earlier, you just got to keep picking up new skills every few years. Um, Nicole and Zian, do you have anything else to add on that front before you we wrap up? The thing that I would add is the one thing we know for sure is being distinctly human in everything you do, every decision, every issue, everything you navigate is going to be the future no matter what. And we know that success is going to be defined by our ability to create those super teams. You know, our ability to actually be able to genuinely create teams where we've got the technology and humans working together. And so whatever the roles might be called, whatever they might be doing, they are, I believe, they are going to be focused on that teaming, that collaboration. It's not going to be enough to just focus over on the side on technology or focus over on the side on user experience. You know, I think it's going to be roles that more and more focus on how do humans work and think? What does the technology do? And how can we really create that teaming to unlock those, 
you know, new outcomes and value that, you know, I keep on saying we would never have been able to achieve without it. Sounds great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, uh, I'll, maybe I'll just land on two things uh, uh, for, for angle at individuals, right? Uh, the first of which is what Sinue and Nicole has, have talked about already in terms of joining the dots and architecting, right? Architects. And that's something that is not as well articulated by many employers, but essentially what they want, right? So, you know, looking at how you can bring together cross-functional skill sets uh, is going to become increasingly important. I also don't know what the future is, so I dare not even talk about tech, but what is now? This is what is now, right? A lot of employers are telling us these things. Not as clear as the two panelists here, but uh, these, these are things they want because complex problems are arising uh, and, and sticking to one track is, is not, it's just not good enough for them anymore. Um, and the second thing I would say is uh, not to chase trends, right? Uh, just because you've read an article on how great a certain technology is, right? And to just dive straight in into thinking, you know, that's the next career pivot for you, right? There's so many, you know, strong advice from, you know, the group here that, you know, they've shared their own personal journeys and what they look out for as employers. Um, also look at yourself, right? Um, what you think you can do, what you're good at, right? What you're interested in, like what Nico has rightly pointed out. So uh, don't chase trends, right? Uh, when it comes to tech, I think that's a, a, a real danger. Yeah, that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you so much for being such a great panel, everyone. Um, Zihan, Sinue, and Nicole, you had like some great insights and I love how engaging you were with audience questions. Um, just as like final takeaways, um, you know, please do look at the chat for the link that Zing shared. Um, SG Innovate has a new program coming up um, and Zihan has shared a link to a new group coaching. Um, do check out the study that Nicole shared as well, um, Deloitte's uh, human capital study, um, as well as, um, you know, do check out like um, Tiger's uh, career opportunities as well as Tiger Academy. And on our side, we're going to be um, launching something on Monday, which is called How We Got There, where we're going to feature uh, different panels across tech, data, venture capital, media, et cetera. And it's just gonna be about women who talk about how they've built their careers just to provide a roadmap on how they got there. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Zing, I'll pass it over to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Shinue, Nico, and Zuhan for your insights and perspective. And of course, thank you, Aziza, for the amazing moderations. Of course, you cannot forget our viewers tuning in and for your great engagement and asking our speakers the questions you have in mind. We hope do hope this discussion allows you to find the inspiration and encouragement to look for the shortest point while crossing the tech career river. And for any employers here to hopefully bring back some food for thought in hiring an inclusive team. So as um, Aziza has mentioned, feel free to look at the links below and see how it is you can further your career or if there's any coaching that you like uh, in the chat box in below. And uh, do keep an eye out for your post-event email with the recording to the sessions and probably ways to connect with our speakers. So until we meet again, thank you so much and bye. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you so much.